Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Term 2 uh, or June K-12 slash P-12, depending on what part of the world you live in, Canvas user group. Um, today, we've got a whole bunch of topics uh, that our user group committee have thought might be really great to talk about. Uh, and for those who are on the call, uh, COVID aside, um, <laughs> if you're able to, we'd love for you to put your cameras on uh, so that we can see your lovely faces and so that we can interact as if we are there in person um, and uh, uh, you know, kind of replicate as, as much as we can as if we're there on site and saying hello to everyone. Um, and today's agenda is quite jam-packed. <laughs> so uh, there's, a, there's a lot that we'd, we'd like to have a chat about and we would love for you to share anything that you're doing at your particular school and uh, feel free to unmute uh, and to share or, or to share screen. We've allowed lots of permissions for everyone to share screens and to unmute and to do whatever you need to during this meeting. So it really is a user group. It's not an instructor um, talkathon. Um, so yeah, we, we'd love to have your input into the meeting. Um, and you can see number one item on the agenda there is some Canvas merch. So for two people that who actually do participate on the meeting today, we'll be sending out some Canvas merch your way. Um, so we'll randomly select uh, two people who, but you know, the requirements are that you've actually participated in the meeting in, in some way, shape or form. Uh, but one other thing I'd like to share with you, and we, we talked about this in the K-6 user group, um, just a couple of weeks ago and there is a feature idea on the community uh, in relation to the canvas parent app and we'd love for you to get your feedback on the canvas parent app and things that you would like to see um, in relation to adding in additional feedback uh, so you know the, the feedback that instructors or teachers leave uh, to students on their assessments and how you the sorts of things that you would like to see in the canvas parent app that aren't there currently uh, that is related to that. So Rio's just chucked that in the chat there. Um, so this is specifically around, you know, comments, rubrics, feedback, all of that kind of stuff appearing in the parent app for assessments because uh, they're currently not there. Uh, you can just see the mark uh, that students get for their particular assignments. You can't see all the feedback and everything currently. Um, so feel free to jump on that thread and provide your feedback and your use cases. So. Uh, help the product team understand why that's important to you. Uh, that goes a long way in helping them to know the direction they should head in when developing any new features for the app. Um, all right, so topic number one, may as well kick straight on. Things that we've learned through the pandemic that have stuck with us. Um, so feel free, whoever would like to, to go first uh to to have a bit of a chat about you know what's actually stuck uh since we've kind of gotten past the main part of the the pandemic and um yeah that because not everything has but some things have it looks like sue's unmuted she wants to say something so oh no <laughs> um who, who likes to kick us up on that front i might do that might as no, well <laughs> Hi, everybody. Good to see you all again. Um, one of the things that stuck with us most after the pandemic was actually to have some templates for our classes um, and the content that was to be taught um, in each lesson. So we didn't previously used to do this um, and we do now and it's definitely brought around by the remote learning aspect. So when we were remote learning, we would create a um, templated set of instructions around what was expected to be done in that class, um, including things like where were we and learning focuses, what pieces of um, work were expected to be uh, brought back. So Paul, you said I could share my screen and I might as well just share um, a copy of our blueprint course and what that looks like. Um, to give a little bit more of a visual to what I'm saying here. Uh, which oh, uh, uh, I think this, uh, the sharing settings. Yeah, you, yep. I think you just need to stop sharing, Paul. Oh, yeah, that would help. 
<laughs> Go for it. Awesome. I think that hopefully works. Yeah, so um, I've had this for a while where we've got a blueprint course that is a bit like a template. So this is before templates were available in Canvas and we've still got this here, um, which is a essentially um, our course template. So it's got your basic um, buttons or direction for our students. However, um, under modules here, which is where we would generally pull our lesson there you can see that it was obviously then as a blueprint pushed out all of our can spaces that uh, you would duplicate the template page and write it up as their own or so sorry uh, uh, Rachel I think you're, you're dropping out a little bit okay no worries. Um, is she dropping out for everyone else as well? Okay. Yeah. Yes and no. Huh. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. If you wouldn't mind just going back a little bit. No worries. <laughs> Thanks. So we created a template for each of our lessons. And this is what it looks like. And it stuck with us after remote learning, but in a much smaller sense. So it started off looking a bit like this with a lot of content. Um, and then at the start of term one this year, we ended up with a much smaller version of this template, um, which is this one here. And we changed the colors and whatnot. So it looked like something new and different. Obviously a lot less there. Um, a lot less requirement without the online class aspect. And I loved it. So I kept it on even as we haven't requested it from them um, and they've enjoyed it. We have also made this lesson direction template compulsory whenever a teacher is asking for a cover for their class. So if another teacher is to come and cover their class, um, then this needs to be filled out in its entirety so that the covering teacher can um, know what's expected. And so the students know what's expected of that lesson. So that's one key thing that has stuck with us and that we'll continue to have long past COVID. That's, um, that's fantastic, especially from an equity perspective. Yeah. Because we still, uh, we're, even though we're kind of past COVID, um, I know Stacy would beg to differ um, at the moment. Uh, we're not really past it, are we? And there, there are both teachers and students who are off. Um, and, you know, we're, we're being hit now by this terrible flu that everyone seems to be getting at the moment as well. So uh, being able to have that as a standard thing so that students know exactly where to go, teachers know exactly what to do, where to go. Um, I'm sure it's beneficial on both fronts. Um, does anyone have any? Yeah. Oh, here we go. John has said, how, how do cover <laughs> teachers access the course? Yeah, um, that's a pretty good question. And I think that I've been trying to take um, over quite some years now, but it has been the, uh, this has been the catalyst for us actually scripting our teachers into the classes that we have on a daily basis. So we'll... Oh, Rachel, I think we've lost you. Oh, it looks like we've fully lost Rachel. All right, we're gonna have to circle back to Rachel because I think we're all interested in her answer. Um, <laughs> we're all hanging. Uh, whilst we're waiting for Rachel, is there anyone else who wants to jump in? And what's, what's stuck with you? Well, uh, I was just going to say with covering the casual teachers, we have a casual account on our canvas that they can all access. So they get pretty much viewing access, but not, they can't change or edit anything. So they can access every course, no matter what, um, they're covering, but they just can't, uh, change anything or, you know more the point delete anyone's work so 
that's how we do it. I don't know how other schools do it. David will probably um, give you more of the technical back end of that, but that's um, that's the easiest way we found. Yeah. yeah so we've got um, we, we've got. Uh, I'll start my video. We've we've got a casual account that has a read only admin account, but we've also got all the staff members in a staff a, a role, and that has the same permission. So they get access to theirs, but if they go to the course, to add, they, everyone gets an admin. They can go to courses and they can go all the courses. So, but we've also got a similar idea with the template. We've got, we've, we're fortunate to have um, City Labs with us as well. So every time a course is created, it gets a templated course um, that, that's all, all set up, ready to go. So as soon as Central Sync, bang, create the course, there it is, it's ready to go. So we want to refine that a little bit more, but um, that was one of the things that was new. Nice. I think Gareth, you, you do a similar thing. Is that right? Yeah, we're doing very, very similar. We don't have a um, the north up in the Northern Territory. We don't have a raft of relief teachers, but all of our staff are teacher observers, so they can actually look and get ideas from other ones. And all of our relief teachers have their own account on the sub account, either our primary or whatever um, across the various campuses. Um, and we have links and it has worked mostly very well, <laughs> mostly. Um, the main thing is, is actually having the students saying, well, we know what to do and the relief teacher actually being then the facilitator and often going in and saying, yep, yeah, I now know that you're still on the right track, um, particularly because more often than not, they're out of subject area in our relief roles. So they're actually supporting in the assessment or whatever is left so they can see and know that the kids aren't completely off the track. Um, Julia, you had your hand up earlier. I, I don't want to skip over you. Oh, yeah, thank you, um, Paul. Look, I just want to say, um, Rachel, I think I, I took a little screen grab of it, but wasn't there a bit below that had something like extension activities or something in your... Because I really like the idea of providing a bit of student agency and obviously looking after a high, a, you know, high ability students that those students that really loved remote learning, um, that you're sort of catering for them back in the classroom. So I really like that bit. Awesome, thank you. I might just pop a screenshot of it in the chat there if I can. I'm happy to share what we've done there. Yeah, it, you you dropped off just as you were getting to sorry. the good bit, I think. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> work issues. Oh no. Um, <laughs> Uh, so feel free to share your screen, actually, again, and um, I'm sure everyone would just love to kind of circle back and have a look if that's okay. Okay, You're sure. Coming through loud and clear now. No worries. <laughs> Take two. Um, so this is what we were looking at. We've actually got um, two lesson templates. So there was one that was for remote learning, and then there was the one that we now use. So um, the one that we now use is a little less um busy maybe <laughs> and this is the one that we're currently using um, so it's got all of the bits and pieces uh, where were we what's the learning focus what bits and pieces would we use and in here you might end up linking out to other pages or modules within canvas um, or external tools as well so um, for mathematics you might be linking out to um, enrollo or some sort of a textbook thing as well um, and this also started off our year. So uh, quite often we'd have some students off with COVID and whatnot. So um, our process was to have a Microsoft Teams link and allow students to listen into our lesson. So if we talk about hybrid learning, um, it's tricky. And I think we can all agree with hybrid learning being something that it's a bit difficult to have in a classroom of, or in our case, like 20 something boys. And then there's a few at home. And how do you manage that? So we decided not to try to hybrid learn. Um, we decided to allow a window into the classroom at the start of this year. So um, moving on from the remote learning aspect, but just allowing them to participate if they were home and well enough as well. Um, so you are asking there, Julia, about the maybe the option that we had previously with all of the extra extension options. So our original was this template here, which had a few more headings. So again, 
where were we learning focus um, and the on options there sort of stayed um, but evidence of learning extension opportunities and even a review option um, were not required later on so yeah that is pretty cool though um yeah it, it it came about because we needed the direction i think that without this template we wouldn't have survived consistency in remote learning and i think that really saved us um so i'm grateful we ended up putting it in place yeah nice um now uh, when you say ms teams you're talking about a team's meeting yes yeah right okay. so our process there originally was to get all of our teachers to create a Teams meeting and invite all of their students to that Teams meeting. And then um, we ended up turning on the Teams meeting tool within Canvas, which allowed teachers to just um, pop a link in there. And they used, they could use the same meeting link over and over again if they wanted to. Um, is anyone else using any of the new Microsoft integrations in their Canvas instance, like the Teams meetings, the OneDrive, yes. uh, the actual Teams LTI? Yeah. Yeah, been using it for a while now. So, yep. Is that the... Well. Makes it, it very simple. Is that the one that, that we built um, a while ago or is that the new Microsoft one? Um, I think I updated that to the new Microsoft one not long ago, but no. We could no. Hang on, there is a new one, but the department haven't turned on permission for it. I think. Yes. Yeah. That's okay. it. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what I thought. Um, yeah. <laughs> something that uh, hopefully ITD can address eventually. Uh, well, so it's been a long time. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, unfortunately, it's because of the the Department of Education. You know, it's all controlled at the department level uh, for public schools. Um, oh, did I for Northern Territory? Okay. Um, great. That, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, so yeah, because they they control the, the Microsoft uh, in tenant. Um, yeah, they're the ones who have to authorize everything, uh, which is a little bit difficult, particularly when you've got a whole bunch of schools that you need to do it for. Um, so I kind of get both sides. But um, Okay, um, is that something, speaking of the new tools, is that something that uh, people would like to have a separate session on, the, the new Microsoft tools? Um, so Rachel and, and Kristen and others, uh, if you're using it, um, yeah, how would you feel about us all kind of having it just a separate session, maybe separate from the regular user group, just purely on the new Microsoft tools, and we can all share how we're using them? Um, does that work? All right. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be good for us. Um, I'll have to get a few of our other people to join in. I, I don't get a chance to use it very often at the moment. Okay. Yeah, that would be fantastic. And that's another good point, actually. If you do have any other teachers or uh, anyone at the school that you think would be beneficial coming to these sessions and sharing and um, participating, definitely invite them along. Share the link uh, for them to register and come along. All right, uh, well, well, we'll reach out to the people who said yes, that they use the tools <laughs> and we'll try and organize something uh, to see if we can get something happening. Possibly, uh, yeah. Uh, what do you think about before the end of term? Um, if, if people are available. I know we're into, well, we're starting to get close to reporting season. <laughs> um, so just mindful of that. But if we do it in a couple of weeks, possibly we can make that happen if that works for everyone. All right, let me share my screen. Uh, and unless there's anything else anyone wants to talk about, we've, we've had um, yeah things we learned through the pandemic. Before we move on, is there anything else anyone else wants to share on that topic? Nope. Okay. Future of learning at school. So learning models and the importance of involving parents and making use of the calendar. I think Stacy um, and David Somerville, you guys spoke about this briefly. Um, and uh, previously also, Rachel, I think 
you might have touched on this a little bit. But yeah, Stacey and David, is there anything you want to share on that before we open up to everyone else? Um, or just uh, we've always found, or I've always found teaching, having the use of the calendar, putting the kids' lessons on the calendar, it, it just makes a huge difference um, for, well, for the kids that have special adjustments or anything like that, they can actually see what's going on. I know when David goes into his class, he'll always say, what are we doing today? Because it makes them check the calendar. We've still got staff that don't use it. And I was just actually looking at it then. Um, but then the fellow that's taken over my classes at the moment, um, he's using the calendar now as well, which is great. So he's putting all his lessons on because, you know, not only is it um, great for the kids to be able to see beforehand, it's also great for the kids to see if they've been off sick. Um, they can look at the days that they were sick and they can actually check what um, what the lesson was or what happened in the class. And I just link the actual lesson um, to the calendar. So I don't do anything special. I just, you know, go today, you know, here it is, here's what we're doing and it's the lesson, bang, and away we go. So the kids can actually see and then sometimes I'll put up um, things like a screenshot of the whiteboard if we've written anything extra on the whiteboard or <clears throat> I'll put in... Um, in the calendar as a note, here's where we got up to this lesson. So if, you know, if um, students are sick, then they go, oh, okay, they only got up to there, so I don't have to worry about absolutely everything that is in that lesson or on that sheet. So that's been, um, and we were doing that pre-pandemic as well. So through the pandemic, all the staff used it, but afterwards I think they've sort of thought it was a bit of an admin burden, but it's it's not. It's actually you know, it just makes life easier, I think. And then the parents can see it as well. So they can actually say, I saw what you did at school today in Japanese. There it is. You, you know, can you count to 10 for me or something, you know? So there's, um, I, I just find it a very, very useful function of Canvas and I live through the calendar. And then it also becomes my, um, a bit of an electronic registration as well. I can see when things have been done. And, uh, you know, if I do make notes on the calendar, then I know when I, where I'm up to. So, um, it's great. Um, so for the calendar it, to become cluttered, no, because the kids only see their five periods on the calendar. So I'll put up mine, my five periods for the day or whatever it is. So um, I'll only have that and plus the other teachers. So for me, it's okay to manage. But if, you know, if you were, um, if you had a rather large faculty or anything, then yes, it could become cluttered, but not on the kids because we section out the classes. So the kids will only get their class lesson. So they won't get everybody's lessons um, or everybody's messages the same if we do announcements. So that's what we do. So it's... Just, um, just adding to that, the, mm -hmm. um, the well, we don't all have sections. Our science faculty insist on having their own courses. But anyway... Um, when we started doing it's one of the lessons we did learn in the pandemic and 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 paul and rio you were involved in this there's a state on microsoft oh, sorry there's a state in canvas called deleted last completed and that's a a setting now that needs to be turned on in central not completed because what will happen is if you've just got it on completed and a kid moves from one section to another they will get the calendar from both sections they need to be removed from the last section they were in so essentially what that that state does is if if they are removed if they move a course then that's fine no, it'll be deleted if it's um it'll be completed sorry if it's if they go from one section to another then it's then it's deleted so and that's yeah. that's that's on the central sink so yeah that this is related to when you're syncing your data from your student information system there's a status that you can do for the enrollments um, the standard one is active, um, but yeah, when you when you move them, you can change um, the status so that the one that Dave was talking about deleted, last completed. Um, so the I'm just going back on on the chat a little bit here. There was a, a little bit of chat uh, about uh, adding the dates to pages in Canvas, so which actually adds them to the to do uh, list in Canvas. Uh, was everyone aware that you do that? Looks like some people were, some weren't. Um, so you can actually add a, a, a date onto a, a page in Canvas. So if you've set something up like Rachel has, where you've got 
um, yeah, a, a lesson that is for a specific day or whatever it is, and you've got the learning outcomes for that lesson and whatever, you could actually put a date on that and that will show up in the calendar as well and on their to-do list. Uh, so that can be really, really handy uh, for students as well. Um, yeah, it does It does actually make a difference. We had um, a few or a few parents, you know, kids with special needs that they do actually like to be prepared before class. And that was one thing they actually requested um, for their students. So when they do do a specific request, those teachers will put that calendar item on. We'd like our, all our staff to be doing it, but it's just, you know, it's one of those things where we can't we can't mandate that just yet. But um, if I get my way, I will. But um <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, but, yeah, it's it's just a really easy organisational tool. And if the kids don't, you know, use it, that's one thing. But for the staff and those that do, it's it's really, um, really important. And then also, too, you know, if, if you know, I'm not going to lose a registration file or anything like that, everything's sitting on the calendar there and, and annotated, ready to go on the dates that we did it at the times we did it. So the classes that we did it with. So it's really, it really does drill down into that. And it also, I mean, there's a comment there as well. Um, instead of creating extra tasks uh, as assignments or something like that in Canvas and cluttering up the, the grade book in Canvas, um, it keeps it separate from that because a lot of those things are just little, you know, class formative tasks, you know, almost like homework. That's uh, right. And so it's it's not something that you really need in the grade book. It's not counting towards their final grades. No. And it says uh, assignments. So we do section out our assignments anyway as well a lot of the time because if they're on at different times, depending when we can get um, computer labs or anything like that. Um, but then sometimes, you know, with elective classes, being a small faculty, we only have one elective class. So that's um, easy as well. It's not a big faculty. But um yeah, with assignments, if we've got one due date, then yeah, it's, we put on the due date for the entire year. So that's that's where that sits. Um, there's also that part of that point there and the importance of involving parents um, and, and making use of the calendar. Um, I'm trying to remember who in our meeting was talking about that. <laughs> we had a uh, the K-12 committee meeting. Um, and uh, yeah, what... Well, how do you involve parents um, with the learning process at, at your school? Well, if they're observers, then they can see what is coming up and then, you know, we'll usually ask them to sort of keep at least the calendar as a notification um, to make sure that they know what's going on. Um, but the, the parent feedback that we have had based on calendar use, it hasn't been a huge amount, but it all has been positive what they have lot has preferred using that and you know through that COVID period as well it was one of those lessons learned um, where the parents did like the calendar because they could see the five periods or the four periods whatever if it was a bit compressed for the for the day being you know if they had some sort of you know screen time break or anything um, that they could actually see that and they could see the plan for the day and what the kids were scheduled to do so the kids could then jump on and if it was you know, if it wasn't live, if there was no Zoom meeting or team meeting or anything like that with the teacher, then they could go off and um, do it at any time they wanted, really. So it was just um, just a lot easier in that in that period of time as well. So haven't had that much parent feedback recently, but um, every year when we get our new year sevens in, the parents really do um, like the use of that tool. Anyway, so I don't know, David, have you got anything else to add to that? Of course, the um, the bit where you send out of the marks, whether that you know somebody's got something due, overdue, because the parents are on there, then they're getting that too. So that's that's really good. I, I had a actually here's a story for you, Canvas people. I had a I had a phone call from the school the other day. I won't name the school, but um, <clears throat> they were after an ability to be able to do mass estimations in the mark book in Central. I said, why would you want to do that? And they said, well, because we've got lots of kids that don't hand stuff in. I said, well, you need to get Canvas because if you have Canvas, then you won't need that fact, that functionality of, of marks. So, yeah, anyway. 
I left them with that idea. Hopefully they'll take it up. <laughs> yeah. And probably the other thing too with the parents and, you know, well, I, I don't know how, how appropriate this is, but um, with the calendar and also with student usage, I did have a parent meeting with a rather prickly parent um, oh, about oh, last week or so. But I did manage to print off everything that um, the student had to do and then all their Canvas usage and they were complaining that, you know, about a certain class that they um, didn't believe that they had been completely supported in. And when I pulled off their entire usage and then I asked them to find the course code of that, of that course that they were complaining about, they couldn't find it. So the child had actually not been on that course. They'd looked at everything else. Everything was in the calendar for them. Everything was in announcements. Everything had been messaged by the teacher. So when I showed that parent that the course of the meeting actually changed more to um, directed at the child's lack of um, <coughs> um, usage of that <laughs> so of that um, course in general. So it was a huge saviour and um, a, a, just a great thing to be able to hand to hand to the parent to actually show them that maybe their child may have stretched the truth a wee bit, just a wee bit. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I like what Rio's actually posted in there because it is related. Um, whilst we're talking about parents, uh, there is a, a new feature coming out in this month's release um, that it, if, or well, hopefully you're aware that in the grey book in Canvas, for particular assessments, you can actually, uh, th there's a feature that says message students who, and uh, when you click on that feature, you can select you know, message students who have submitted, have not submitted, have scored more than this, have scored less than this. Uh, you can you know, define uh, the group of students that you're going to message. You don't need to know who they are. Canvas just automatically knows and sends a message to those people. Uh, so that what's being added is message observers of students who. So you can message both the students and the observers at the same time. You can be selective about the observers. You can you know, press a little uh, cross against the name to remove them if you don't want to add in those parents or, and or students. Uh, it's really, really cool. So just keep an eye out for that one. And that's, yeah, it's this month's release, I believe it's coming out. Yeah, uh, I think it's on the 18th, so... Uh, and if you aren't using message students who, then you should check it out because <laughs> it'll change your life. Uh, Kate, feel free to unmute. Sorry, um, I might be in a bit of a noisy staff room. No, I love that feature. I think it sounds great. Can you hear me at all? Or yes, no? yes. Can you? Yes. Hear me? yes. Okay. No. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if we've covered this, but. Um, Sort of it's a cross between templates and learning models. We're sort of at that phase where we haven't really implemented a template yet, but we are in the process of implementing a learning model. So we're trying to join the two together and create a template based on our learning model. So I suppose I'll just show you what we've got if you're interested um, for a lesson. Yes, please. Just where am I going? Here we go. So I'm not sure if you can see. So we've introduced a learning module that has a, a sorry. A, a learning model that has a number of steps, uh, you know, the ideal steps for the ideal lesson where we start with engage and motivate. And then we have access prior knowledge. We have our explicit teaching. We have collaborative instruction, then independent learning and reflect and feedback. So we're sort of in this process of creating this template that then the teachers would then put their content within each of these boxes. And we decided we'd create little icons to go with the different steps. And what we would do with this is we'd place 10 of these in a module itself and give staff access to the module. So yeah, just something that we're sort of working towards in combining templates and our, our learning model. That's great. Um, yeah, I, from a student perspective, I, I always like to think of things from a student perspective. And when you have that sort of consistency, um, it's it makes a big difference because you know what to expect, you know where to find things, you know what's going on, uh, and it it also is a great guide for for teachers as well. Um, so, David, is that a, a question for Kate? 
Uh, so he says, how are the templates accessed and used by the teachers? So um, similar to the way that um, you roll out a template or a blueprint course at the beginning of the year, that module would, would sit in the blueprint or the template course that are given to staff at the year, and they will simply duplicate it and add their content as they go. Does that make you sense? Also, you can also send, set a, um, well, canvas-wide template for the whole school in the yes. settings. Go and have a look at the settings. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So you just go and create a create a template page course, set it as a template, and then you go to the settings at the front of the canvas and just pick it. Yeah, um, but that's sort of something we're hoping to introduce at the beginning of next year. But some yeah. teachers are start to keen are keen to start using it now. So one of our workarounds to it, it's not ideal, is to put a copy in our commons of the module, and then they download a copy of the module, and then they just duplicate the module. That's not a bad idea as well. Oh, sorry, go ahead, John. Sorry, that's kind of similar to some of the things that we're doing here, apart from we've kind of constructed a slightly more convoluted uh, course structure. So we actually have two uh, courses for every class that runs. We have the uh, year group course, um, which sits with every student in every class inside it, um, which is used for assessment tasks, uh, dispensing, course overview, documentation, um, and let me just remind myself what else we bunged in there, um, and kind of general documentation for the course. And then we that is sectioned off so that each individual teacher um, for the year group can access that and mark their own classes assessment tasks. But we also have like a resource bank in there, which is formed at the start of each year. And then they just use the copy to functionality to copy it over to their second course, which is their individual course for their day to day teaching. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to see this in action. I'll just chuck up my other okay. screen. Go for it. Um, so if you have a look up the top here, I've got my uh, year nine IST class here. If I click into that, we've just got some standardized like. Um, buttons on some javascript but it loads my lovely connection speed here i've got zoom on uh, where have you gone so up here we've got our little buttons that one of our development developers just chucked in um to make every course page land the same um so we've got the syllabus documentation in there which is actually just a student by we just pick up the terminology from uh, Canvas. It's really, it's actually just an overview of the course that's designed for the students um, to give them kind of basic information. Um, and then let's go back to the home screen. So are you utilizing the Canvas syllabus page for that? No, not really. Like that's just a, a blank page that we've kind of hacked together. Um, right. We find that syllabus wasn't doing what we wanted it to, but we assume the terminology. And then over under the uh, course resources, which was that second button, we're utilizing the modules tool. Um, so down the bottom here, we've then got all the resources for the entire course for the year, um, which sit there unpublished in order for um, staff to grab it and drag it over. But then so that the um, button isn't completely empty, we have things like things like stock resources, which sit up the top here, which is just links that are gonna be useful for the kids to access and use. Um, and then what they kind of do with all those bits there, they drag them across at the start of the year or when they're teaching it um, to, if I just go back to my dashboard, to this second course, which in this case would be, the load, come on. Come on, great speed today. Uh, just up here, um, so we've got the, the second one, which is the set course. And then that content from the first course, we might, the teacher can pull it across, differentiate it and sequence it in uh, this. So these black buttons on the left just link back to that, set, that first course. And then the yellow buttons correspond to the tools for the course that we're in. So the modules there, you jump into that and that's where we set up our teaching sequences. So you'll see here for my term two content, I've got uh, the text headers set up to break up the content. So we just chuck in sort of text headers to break up the week so the students can find it without the complication of the calendar or anything like that. They can 
find where they're up to. They then just have a page with a bit of a summary there and then any content pages and tasks that proceed after that um, in sequence in the mod module so that when it gets migrated over from the year group course, um, then it, you can kind of drag it into your sequence so that you can set it up so you've got kind of everything uh, in a yeah, kind of easy to understand um, sequence within the modules in the class. So it's just kind of manipulating the system a little bit more. Cool stuff. Um, this, is, this is why these user groups are great. There's no one way to do it. Um, but I, I always get ideas well, and people tell me they get ideas uh, and you know, everyone comes up with their, their own hybrid versions of, of what they do. Uh, and disseminate that throughout their school. So it's fantastic. Um, so there's a bit of chatter going on in the chat about um, there's a lot of City Labs love going on. Uh, so uh, City Labs is a third party tool. Um, well, Design Plus is the name of the tool um, by a company called City Labs uh, that helps you to create templates and uh, layouts and do all sorts of funky stuff uh, inside of Canvas. Um, so yeah, there's a, a few advocates uh, in the room at the moment who was spruiking their wares. Um, but also Rachel has kindly shared uh, some of the CSS that they're using to style their headers. Um, so if you're into HTML and CSS and things like that, then you can uh, grab that, just yoink it from the chat now and you can play around with that as well. Uh, okay. Is there anything else anyone wants to share along those lines before we move on to the next topic? I have a feeling when we're, we're going to run out of time to cover everything that we had on the agenda today, but that's okay. That means it's been great. All right. Let me share my screen. And we've been talking about, yeah, learn different learning models, uh, involving parents using the calendar. Uh, things that have had to change, we, we've kind of covered this, um, but yeah, what have you had to change in your in your normal practice? It, it's similar to what we've talked about uh, initially at the beginning. Um, we've talked about hybrid learning, although um, being able to get a peek into the classroom is not the same as hybrid learning. I actually don't mind the idea of that, um, but uh, is there anything anyone wanted to share on that front? Nope. Um, so now roles for substitute. Yeah, I'll jump in there, Paul. Oh, go go ahead, Dad. Um, I think one of the largest challenges that the staff and uh, for those people who haven't met before, we're at CDP and we've got multiple schools and 10,000 license holders. So um, we get a pretty broad spectrum of people and their experiences. But um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that I try and work with our schools is that the normal isn't what we've experienced over the last two years. That's the abnormal. And we've got teachers that are dealing with the physical, the travel, the classrooms, and um, their focus and their feelings of obligation or mandate or mandatory um, tasks that they have to do still in the online context, as well as meeting the face-to-face -face needs, needs to be scaled back. So um, a lot of the work that I've been doing is with leadership teams of schools to be clear, really clear to their staff on the fact that they don't expect every single resource, every single instruction to be within the Canvas environment. Um, and the teachers need to look after themselves and they also need to consider the fact that their students um, also can't be overloaded with text as well. So if some of those instructions can come verbally, that's fantastic. Um, if the teachers can use their announcements and their camp and their calendar posts as their introduction slide for the class to save them walking in and writing on a board or connecting to a screen and bring up another slide deck that's showing the same information that they need to they need to look after themselves. They need to be smart. They don't need to overload their their mark books. Um, yeah, so my 20 cents worth is the normal isn't what we've had for the last two years. And let's be considerate of one another in terms of what we still believe is required because uh, you'd need to balance between the face-to-face -face and the online. I've got a quick question on that, David. Um, I mean, uh, parents are probably 
used to having everything online, how, how have you kind of managed those expectations? Uh, that comes down to the communication to the parent group. So in terms of parent expectation, um, quite, a, quite a few of our schools um, believe in student leadership and the fact that what the parents can access is actually greatly reduced so that the parent can wingman them, um, not, helicop not helicopter them. Um, yeah, so in terms of what the parents can expect to experience from the school environment um, is usually detailed within the communications policy of the school, um, which is usually embedded within the syllabus page, um, which we also use for all of our compliance as well. So um, yeah, clear and comprehensive communication and consistency, quality assurance processes, ensuring that the courses are, are meeting those requirements um, are, are key. So one key example would be a, a school um, Put their hand on their heart and said we supply a vocab list for every single topic of every single subject and as a parent you can access that on the on the syllabus page which is a feature of the parent app and um yeah so once you once you make your statement like that you've got to make sure that you're actually running those processes as a leadership group to ensure that those vocab lists are there yeah follow through i like that uh wingman instead of helicopter um particularly in the context of top gun maverick just coming out it's a great movie by the way um the uh and also I like how you incorporated inflation it's not two cents it's 20 cents now i love that um but we love your 20 cents david thank you for thank you for that um cool is there anything else anyone wants to chat about on that front sue yeah i think um our school's quite unique because we've got distance education and on-campus students so in terms of what we've leveraged, um, every distance education has to have a, obviously a fully, a full blown course. Um, and so in trying to be more like trying to increase teacher efficacy, we've just united the two schools. So everything goes through Canvas as a through line. Um, and then the, so we have um, like a content course that is gone to, um, we've got a DE version of it and then an on-campus version of it that's already preloaded with content. Our teachers aren't making content as such. Um, the only ones that are making content are the ones who are still um, in the sort of stage six rollout um, as we go into like our accredited HSC course in DE. So we've gone, we've gone down the very, very consistent level um, and collective efficacy rather than teachers building individually. But there's obviously a, a kind of, um, a bit of a price to pay for that because there isn't as much autonomy in the classroom they have to follow not only the program but the canvas course because both the DE student and the on-campus student have to be at the same place at the same time um, so there's a lot of um, keeping the schools aligned um, and that's also meant that we've had one assessment course per so we've got content course and assessment course and in the assessment course that's where we've got um, just the summative tasks and all the instructions go out because everything has to be equitable across the two schools. So ours is quite unique, I think, um, but that has made a huge increase of obviously Canvas in the classroom um, because everything's laid out for our teachers. A bit different. Yeah. So following on, following on from that, when we're talking about using Canvas, it's not just the delivery of content. Using Canvas could be Today, the PE teacher took their netball, their class out and did netball, right? Mm -hmm. Or our PE teachers use Canvas to mark um, practical lessons. So they will set up a task, they'll, they'll have it, and then they'll have their mobile phone on there with the teacher app and they'll go and mark that. That's not actually delivering content to the students in the classroom. Um, Stacey, for example, and myself, all that, that course content's on there. But it could be a lesson that might have an embedded video, the YouTube clip or something that maybe a casual teacher is going to put up. So we're not actually delivering the content and getting the kids to go on Canvas at all, but we're still using Canvas uh, in, in the school to, to as a tool. So there's lots there's lots of different um, tools within Canvas besides just delivering content. That's just a point I'd like to make. 100%, yeah, yeah we're not just content, but we have the content to back up everything that, um, you know, if a student's absent, they can follow everything from home in the same way that, you know, they could do if they were in DE. 
So we're just leveraging what we've already built for our online school um, and using it in on campus when we want to. Yeah, that's awesome. So you're catering, catering for both audiences. Mm. I wasn't. I wasn't this. Sorry, I wasn't this. disagreeing with you. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. I've heard people say, "Oh no, I don't like an LMS because I don't want my kids sitting there doing doing quizzes all the time." That's what I've yeah. heard teachers say. That's that's what I'm saying. Canvas is much more than Google Classroom, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that was my point. There's a lot of there's a lot of tools and integrating tools into Canvas that makes it so much better. Cool. Um, all right. So I, I know we're we're getting very close to to uh, the hour. Uh, there is we have actually covered off. Um, I'll just bring up the agenda again. We have actually covered off the the next one. Uh, you know, setting up roles for substituting for teachers. Um, people have talked about how they've created account level roles where you will have a limited subset of account permissions so that teachers can see other courses. Um, you might have casual teacher roles where um, your casuals can log into Canvas as those roles or, um, or a combination of both. Uh, so is there anything anyone's doing different apart from what we've talked about so far? I think we pretty much covered out off most of the ways that people do it that I'm aware of. Uh, so unless anyone's got anything else to add, I can't see anything in the chat, we'll move on to the next one. So integrations with student information systems. What's going well? And what's not working with your different student information systems? This was a, a bit of a um, interesting hot potato of a topic to chat about. Um, <laughs> I know that there's, there's things that are going really well uh, for some people and there's other things. Let, let's start off with the, the not so well. Um, well, Central's got an issue at the moment with semesterized courses, so uh, it's a really weird one. So if, if, if you've got semester one, semester two courses, um, the teachers are falling off semester one. It happened to us last week. It's then rectified itself. Um, I could fix it by going to Edval and reapplying the semester dates um, and syncing, but um, yeah, I turned off auto for a few days and contacted Central now, some other schools have contacted with the same issue. I mean, other than that, it's, it's fantastic. So no dramas. They're, 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 if you're on a Central school, the check staff links, um, which is something that Ant Anthony Ma put up a little while ago, is very, very helpful for, for the schools to see if it's going to actually sync to Canvas. Um, because uh, in the New South Wales Department of Education, user management sort of is not real good to say the least. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so Sue's got a bunch of central issues. I, uh, David talked about Compass. So Compass is not really catering to Parramatta. Um, so you're building your own integration uh, solution. Uh, David Shields, not David. It's, Sunshine, not that, sorry. It's, not Dave, it's not that they're not catering. They're just providing solutions that don't work. <laughs> so oh, I see. <laughs> I actually, uh, I was actually working with um, Irrawang High School today because they went, they've gone from Millennium to Central to Millennium to Compass and then going back to Central. So, and that's been in a very short period of time because they, guess what? They've had different principles and those principles have liked different systems and then they were told to, to, they were convinced that Compass was the way and then they went on to Compass and realised that it wasn't what they were told. So now they're back to Central. So now they're setting up Central from scratch. So... Yeah, happy happy days. Okay, great. <laughs> um, is there anyone using any anything besides Compass and Cent or Central? Um, I think Rachel, you're using Synergetic. Right? Yeah, we're using Synergetic, which I don't think has a native integration of any sort. So all of our stuff is just scripted in house, and in fact, um, our scripts were created. Of before I arrived, I've been here five years. So let's say <laughs> um, soon after we got Canvas and we're actually about to go through a little bit of a rewrite process because as with any custom built script, we've uh, hacked at it, modified it, 
added little bits to it along the way and it's just becoming a little too much so we need to we need to rewrite um and yeah we're embarking on that um also the need to rewrite is come on a lot faster than we might have previously anticipated because our script um the mammoth part of the script runs overnight so at 1 30 in the morning it starts it takes about 45 minutes to go and it just checks everything so it checks for new classes being created for enrollments being changed um etc cetera, etc cetera. so that every possible option there so a lot of our stuff is automated but back to what i started with early on and john asked the question in the chat before i had some network issues um about adding casual stuff in obviously a sink in the morning that takes 45 minutes is too much when um, we're trying to get the day started. So we've pulled out part of that script and now looking to just like again, modulize it so that we can script in our casual staff directly into um, the classes that they're taking for the day. Um, and then when they're stopped, when, the, when their day's over, they're just made inactive um, in those classes. So that's our process big mammoth script that we've written in-house <laughs> and as new people have changed over the years it's yeah grown all right um I was gonna say Wendy I just took your earbuds out <laughs> you've just caught me as my uh earbuds uh, airpods just failed <laughs> They've okay. just, just we actually have engaged so we're working on a script as we speak um because at it, up until now, it's been a um, very manual process. What we find is that a lot of our students swap between HSC and IB. So not only do they swap, um, you know, subjects, but they actually swap whole, you know, IB to HSC and vice versa. So we have a big issue about removing students from courses as well. So that's a mammoth, talk about mammoth. Um, job right now to get those students removed from certain classes um, it's big as well in that um, if they have spent one term in ib for example then we report on that time that they've spent in an ib class before they take out you know they're removed from there into hsc so we can't remove them as such that they need to be inactive so there's a lot going on for us um, with engage as well <laughs> that's okay. all I'll do right now <laughs> Um, all right, is there anyone else who's using anything different than what wants to, to chime in on? Um, yeah, it, it seems like the running theme is once you get things up and running, it, it kind of goes okay, but sometimes there can be a little bit of a process to, to get it all going, uh, depending on the integrations and, and what you're trying to achieve. David? David Shield. Yeah. Oh, you unmuted. I thought you wanted to... Accidental unmuting. Okay, all right. Uh, now we are at uh, pretty much at 4.30 now. The last topic that we did have on there on the agenda was Canvas feature previews that you should consider enabling. I'm sure none of you are interested in that. So maybe... Um... <laughs> okay, let's quickly have, have a, a chat about some of those. Um, I'll just share my screen and... Let's just have a look at some of these just really quick because um, some of those are, are really cool. So I'm just in my sandbox account here. Um, account and course level mastery scales is something that you might want to look into, but please, please, please watch the webinar that we did recently on the new updates to outcomes before you enable that. Um, and uh, a lot of these allow sub account selection. Uh, it, the main takeaway that you, you should take away from this is to actually have a look at your feature options in your accounts in Canvas uh, and have a look through if there's things that you don't have turned on that look really cool. Um, check them out because there's some really cool stuff in there, like the comment library. I think that's a bit of a no brainer to just switch that on. Uh, one thing you, you should do is just click on the little arrow for the description um, of yeah, what the actual feature option is before you turn it on to see if it is uh, something you'd be interested in. Apply score to ungraded is a new one. So check that one out as well, where you can apply an automatic score to ungraded items. Uh, quite often that's gonna be a zero, but sometimes you might want a different uh, score. 
and that's done at a course level. Once you apply that, it, it does it does that to any ungraded items in the course. So be very careful uh, in using that feature. Um, if you don't have confetti turned on, what are you doing? Please turn that on. That's so much fun. Students love it. Teachers love it. Um, turn on confetti. It's fantastic. Um, default due time, I would turn that on as well. A lot of schools quite often have a policy around when things are due. So check that one out. Um, improved outcomes management, I'll just bring that up to say again, please watch that outcomes webinar before you turn that on because there are some caveats for that. Um, the RCE icon maker is new. That's another one worth checking out. Uh, so these are all account level features and then you head down to the course level features. Uh, and some of these are gonna be depending on school policy. So uh, you might or may not uh, turn on anonymous grading because that might be a policy thing at your school. Emojis and submission comments, check that out because uh, and that just makes life a little bit easier for adding emojis to the comments. Uh, enhanced gradebook filters is a really great one worth turning on. Uh, and also assignment enhancements. Uh, Paul Harmon spoke about this briefly at the K to six user group, but that is a huge improvement from a student perspective as to the view of assignments because it brings everything, the submission, the feedback, everything's all in one screen. Um, so definitely worth checking that one out. Uh, and new course and user analytics. If that's not turned on, I'd highly recommend checking that one out as well. Uh, anything else you want to call out there, Rio, whilst we're on the screen before we finish up? No, I think you've covered it. Um, maybe it's worth touching on course pacing because that's a new one that's come out. Uh, probably oh. doesn't apply to, I suppose, uh, you know, teaching, teaching students. Um, within your schools, but it could be applied for PD purposes. Staff PD. So uh, the way that it works is you've got a start date and it adjusts according, like if you've got assessments and things like that, say in week two and then another assessment in week three, it, it adjusts all of those uh, assessment due dates according to what date that you start. So, um, you know, if you want uh, a teacher to go through a, a particular journey, if they're, you know, being onboarded, within your school, it could be a great idea to kind of implement that. Yeah, that's a really cool feature. That For K-12, um, that's the main use case that we see it for is for staff PD, because staff start at different times of the year. And so you want them to have due dates for any induction courses or anything like that to be staggered um, according to when they start the course. You, you can't really have a fixed due date for that sort of thing. So it's really handy for that. Um, yeah, the embedded re release notes might be a good one as well. Like if, if you uh, sometimes don't go onto the community, it just basically embeds all of those release notes onto uh, your Canvas instance and you can, uh, I guess, check out, check out all of the releases that are happening uh, throughout the year. Um, and yeah, Gareth uh, made a really good point there. Uh, with the original feedback screen for students, you can only see the most recent feedback um, but with assignment enhancements if they've made multiple drafts and multiple submissions you can go back to the previous submissions see the feedback and see the process which is great from a student learning perspective as well um, so yeah cool all right well we've gone over time but i'm glad we're able to cover that um, and uh, thanks so much everyone for coming along as i said right at the very beginning we will uh, do a, a put names into a random <laughs> randomizer uh, for people who participated today and shared and we'll send out for two lucky people uh, a swag pack. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to see you next term at the next user group. But in the meantime, have fantastic. <laughs> I know you love that Sue. Um, have a fantastic uh, rest of your day and we'll catch you at the next one. Thank you. Thanks everyone. everyone. Thanks Paul. Thanks Rhea.